They will be introducing the ideas of ecology of mind through a series of demonstrations, a couple of which will require willing participants to come up and join him on stage. And then following the presentation, he'll take your questions. So we're delighted to, uh, that you can join us this evening, and particularly you, Bo. So please join me in welcoming Bo Lotto. Thanks for coming. And I'm going to start off with a demonstration, which requires a willing or even unwilling helper. Um, yeah, brilliant. OK. Jeez, hands straight up. Brilliant. All right. So this is a recreation of Goethe's shadows. Goethe wasn't the first one to do this, but uh, he sort of made it famous. Come on up. Can I you saw your name? Nina. Nina. Nice to meet you. OK, so what we have here. So what do we have? We have two white lights. OK. And Nina is going to hold up. Nina? is going to hold up a filter, OK? And she's going to put this right in front of this white light. Does everyone understand these are two white lights, OK? So she puts that up, and I'm going to stand here. And does everyone see two shadows? Yes, yeah, so if I put my hand up, you see two shadows. You see a green one on the right and a purple one on the left. You understand why we have a purple shadow, yes? It's the only part of the screen that the purple light is hitting. Where is the green light coming from? Negation? Anyone else? Where's the green light coming from? Ah, let's try another one. OK, so now this is a green filter. I put up my hand, and you see a green shadow on your left and a purple shadow on your right. Where's the purple light coming from? So Goethe insisted there must be a physical explanation for this. But of course, it's all in your mind. The shadow on your left is actually gray. Okay, same two for this one. The shadow on your left is exactly the same color as the purple one before. Okay, so we'll start there. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so context, that's context. Context is everything, okay? We all know that context is everything. Artists have known this for centuries. Here are two images from Delacroix, right? And Delacroix is juxtaposing red and green. So the red flag there stands out because it's more saturated because it's surrounded by green, OK? So the first person to really quantify these relationships between color was someone called Chevrolet, OK? Now, Chevrolet, he was a chemist. And he was hired by the king of France to figure out what was wrong with the dye industry. The problem was that people were creating their tapestries. They were, they were selecting the threads, the colors of threads that they were going to make a tapestry from, get woven together, and be delivered to them. The problem is the colors didn't look like the colors they selected. So they assumed that the problem was in the dyes, so they hired a chemist. Okay? After a few years looking at the dyes, he realized the problem wasn't in the dyes, it was in the brain. Right? He then spent the next 30 years describing the relationships between colors, which led on to something called color theory. Okay? So in this example, the motif there in the red is supposed to look slightly green. The one in the yellow is so, supposed to look slightly blue. That one's supposed to look slightly yellow. Right? Very subtle effects. Okay? And Note that color theory, which drives a lot of what happens in art, is not an explanation of these color effects. It's more a description and a use of these color effects. What I'm particularly interested in is not that context is everything, but why is context everything? Okay? And the idea is that the, to answer this question is to understand how the brain works. If you can understand that, we can understand everything about how we think. And in my lab and studio, we do this all in the realm of color. Why color? Because it's the simplest thing that the brain does. It doesn't get any easier than seeing the lightness of something. Even jellyfish see the lightness of something, right? So if you can understand it at that level, then maybe we can understand it all the way up. 
So to answer first, why is context everything when it comes to color, we have to answer another question, which is what is color for? Right? And I'll show you an example of what color is for in a second. So first thing, color is not light. That might seem odd, right? Of course, light generates perceptions of color, but it's not light. So here's light. Light is a physical spectrum from 4 to 700 nanometers, from short wavelengths to long, from small to big, okay? Right? It's a linear spectrum, okay? That's important. Color is not linear. It's a three-dimensional perceptual space. There are three things to describe any color. The brightness of the color, the intensity, which is here. We also have the saturation, which is the amount of grayness in a color. And we also have its hue, the relative redness, greenness, blueness, and yellowness of a color. Okay? So even at this level, there's no simple relationship between the colors we see and the light that falls onto our eye. What's more is that if we go back to light, the two ends of the physical spectrum, 4 and 700 nanometers, generate perceptions that are actually quite similar, right? Violet and blue, right? Very similar perceptually, but at opposite ends of the physical spectrum. It's like 100 pounds feeling like 1 pound, right? So the brain takes this linear spectrum and morphs it into this amazing three-dimensional space. Okay? So, what is color for? So that was what is color. What is color for? Here's what's color for. Can anyone see the predator? It's about to jump out at you. And if you haven't seen it yet, you're dead. Right? Can you see it? What are you seeing? You're seeing surfaces in a scene according to the amount of light that they reflect. Okay? Has anyone found it? Anyone? Oh, one person, so one survived, all right? <laughs> now let's see the surfaces, not only according to the amount of light they reflect, but also the quality of the light they reflect. Now, for those of you who should have been selected out, there it is, right? And it's because the panther here reflects the same amount of light as the foliage, but they reflect different qualities of light, okay? So differentiating surfaces according to these different qualities is what color is about. The problem is that doing that is actually impossible. Right? What we do every second of the day is actually mathematically impossible. Okay? And I'll explain why. So what's the challenge of seeing color usefully? The pro one of the problems is that the color of our illumination is variable. Okay, so here's an example. Here's something from Terrell Sky Labs. We have the different phases of skylight. As you can see, the quality of the blue illumination varies incredibly. And here are some examples of different qualities of both natural and artificial illumination. Okay, also the intensity of light varies a billion to one. Okay, so the illumination in our environment varies incredibly. Which then begs one question, which is, uh, why is the sky blue? So does anyone know the answer to that question, why the sky is blue? Hmm? Tyndall effect. Right. Well, it's a question that's been debated for several thousand years, and many people still think that, uh, well, many people still don't know the answer to the question. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you why the sky is blue. Okay, we're going to recreate the sky in a bottle here. And this is a recreating an experiment by Roscoe, not Rothko, but Roscoe. Okay? And so what do we have here? What we have is the sun. Okay, this is the sun. This is parallel light. So when the sun hits the earth, it's more or less running in parallel rays. Okay? This is space. Right? So if there were no sky, the sky would look, the, when we look up, it would look black, and the sun would look white. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to add sky into this bottle. Okay? So the question is, that's been debated for many thousands of years, is, is it the stuff in the air? How many people say it's the stuff in the air? No? No one? And how many people say it's the air itself? No one. No one has a view. All right. Interesting. Uh, 
So if you had kids, you would have an answer to that question, right? They, um, so the answer to the question is that it's actually the air itself, right? It's the stuff, it's the air that actually scatters, called Raleigh, Raleigh scatters, scatters the short wavelengths more than it scatters the long, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to add some skim milk into here, and it works better with skim milk than, or non-fat milk than, right? And what's going to happen is that the light is going to hit the milk and it's going to scatter, and it scatters 90 degrees to the angle of incidence. Okay, so the light's coming this way, it scatters that way. So can you all see it's starting to appear violet here? Now if I move this around, yes, people over there can see it, right? And I want to shine it back on the clock, so I think that's quite cool. So now, what's going to happen is the lights, the blue light, so to speak, is being scattered in 90 degrees, but the yellow and red light is passing through. So what we're going to do is we're going to recreate the sunset. So that's the light that hits the Earth, and this is the light in the sky. So we'll add a little bit more sky to our space. And you can see the light going through is now turning the sun's getting lower. Yes? If I go over there, you can see it. Okay. Add a little bit more. Sun's getting lower in the sky. Right? And now it's getting pretty close to night time. Right? Now what we'll do is will make a cloud, okay? Because that's a cloud. Clouds are white because they scatter all wavelengths equally, right? So that's your cloud, okay? So that's London on a, not on a day like today, okay? So what, that, that's just for fun, really. Um, so that's why the sky is blue. But the point of that, I want to lose that. Okay, is to show you both why ecologically or environmentally the, we have this incredible variation in both the intensity and color of illumination. Okay, what, what's also variable is the space between us and the objects we're looking at. Okay, so a couple of years ago I was asked by the BBC to take part in their coast program to, uh, and the question, because they're doing something down at St. Ives, and the question is why is the light in St. Ives unique? And the answer to that question is, well, we don't know if it's unique. So they said, well, could, we, could you come on the program and test? And I said, yes, but it would take about a year. And they said, well, you've got about five minutes. So we decided what we'd do is we'd try to create a situation which would explain why it might be different, right? And the way we did that is we looked at the air, the stuff in the air, not the air itself, but the stuff in the air. And of course, we then needed to compare it to something else. So we compared it to London, okay? So what we did is we filtered the air outside my lab, which is an old street, okay, for three hours at normal respiratory rate. So the air is being sucked through, and all the stuff in the air is being trapped in a filter, okay? And that's what you see in the upper left-hand corner, right? So that's the beautiful quality of the air in London, okay? And this is just a repeat to show it wasn't an accident, right? The one in the middle is down at St. Ives for the same amount of time. And the one at the right is outside my lab after a rainstorm. Okay? So what does that actually mean in terms of seeing color? Well, we can recreate what surfaces look like when you're looking through them through the air of London through the, versus through the air of St. Ives. I think you can guess which one's which, right? This is looking at surfaces through the air in London. All the colors become desaturated. They become increasingly brownish gray. Okay? So, we have two problems. We have the color of illumination is variable, and the color of space is variable. So who cares? The reason why this matters is that if we go back to Berkeley, or Berkeley, depending where you come from, right, we have no direct access to the physical world other than through the light that falls onto our eyes. Okay? So imagine the stimulus. The stimulus is the light that falls onto your eyes. And imagine we're here, okay? That's what's hitting your eye. Now, the quality of that light is determined by three things in the world. The transmittance of the space between you and objects, the reflectance of the objects, and the color of the illumination. 
You vary any one of those three things, and you'll vary the quality of light that hits your eye. Okay? So we can't see these things directly. We can only see the combination of them. Okay? So imagine this is the back of your eye. Okay? Imagine this is your retina. And this is a projection onto the retina from objects in the world. And these two projections are identical in every way. Okay? They're identical in their spectral quality, their shape, their size. Everything about them is the same. And yet, those two projections come from completely different sources. So here's one projection up there, right? Coming from an orange surface under direct light, oriented this way, viewed through some sort of bluish surface. The other projection is there, a yellow rectangle in shadow, oriented that way, viewed through a pink medium. In other words, two completely different sources generating exactly the same projection onto your eyes. All right? If you're... What does that mean? What that means, imagine being given the equation x times y equals z. You're given z, and you have to solve for x without ever knowing y. Impossible, right? There's an infinite number of combinations of x and y that can give you that z. That's the problem that the brain has to deal with. There's an infinite combination of reflectance and illumination that can give rise to any stimulus. A light surface under dark light will generate the same stimulus as a dark surface under bright light. Okay? So if you remember anything, remember that the patterns of light that fall into you are meaningless because they could mean anything. Right? We might look out to the world and see all kinds of meaning, but that's because you're looking at it after your brain has processed it. What we are not seeing is the image itself, and that image is inherently meaningless. So how then does the brain see? And the way it sees is that it learns to see. Okay? First, it has to find relationships, patterns, and images. And then it has to associate those patterns with a meaning. And it's that meaning that we see, that behavioral significance. So we never see what's there, because we can't. What we can only ever see is what was useful to see in the past. Okay? So, this is very obvious in the context of language. So, can you read this? Yes? Okay? Can't tell if you're reading it or not. The question is, what are you reading? Right? Because there's no a priori reason why an H has to go next to that W. The only reason why you put an H there is because the statistics of your experience said, well, it was useful when I had a W and an A before to have an H there. Well, why don't you put a letter next to that T? Because in the past it wasn't useful to do so, so you don't, right? Half the letters are missing, and yet you fill it in according to your experience, right? The same is true when it comes to perceptions of color. So who thinks they know how to throw a ball? Yeah, do you want to try to throw a ball? Come on up. <laughs> well, uh, well, let's see. Someone more, yeah, brilliant. You want to come up? Right. So, what I'm going to show you is how quickly, what's your name? Danny? Daniel. Daniel, how quickly Daniel's brain can redefine normality. Okay? So, can you stand up on here? Yeah, and face that way. Okay? And take that. And what we, I want you to do is I want you to hit that dot. Okay, so first we're going to do a control experiment to make sure he can actually hit the dot, right? Uh, underhand, ideally, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, let's do it a couple of times. We could have been lucky. All right, so now, good. What we're going to do now is put these beautiful glasses on. Okay, let's turn around so everyone can see you. Yeah, and look up. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> okay, turn around now without falling over. This could be a lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> All right, now, hit the dot. Ooh. <laughs> so keep trying to hit the dot. So what's happening? Ah, very good. He's got prisms on. As far as he's concerned, the world has been shifted 20 degrees over to the right. That's his new reality, okay? <laughs> but as you can see, through trial and error, 
his brain is trying to redefine that normality, right? Because he's seeing his behavior wasn't correct, right? But it's starting to become correct, right? And you can see his whole body motion is starting to change. Right? Pretty good. Let's, we, it's important that we get you to do this pretty close. Very important. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Brilliant. Brilliant. One more time. Brilliant. Okay. Here you go. Hit the dot. Ah. <laughs> Let's make sure you go back to normal. So what's happened? Ah, brilliant. Thank you very much. So what happened? When he first had threw the ball, of course, he hit the dot, put the goggles on, and he missed to the right. Okay? Then his brain saw that that was an incorrect behavior. The world had changed. So he redefined normality. When he took the glasses off, he missed to the left, because as far as his brain was concerned, the world had just changed. Right? He was working by a new normal. So, if we have the lights down, is he through there? Can we have the lights down? Yeah, brilliant. This is one we can all do. Okay? So, first, I want you to look at these two scenes. You'll see they're the same. Yes, one is just an inversion of the other. Okay? What I want you to do, everyone agree? Yeah? Okay, I want you to look at the dot on the top between the red and the green. Okay? And I want you to just stare at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. Okay? And I'll tell you what's happening while you're doing that. Your brain is learning that its right side of its visual field is under red light, and its green side of its visual, sorry, the left side of its visual field is under green light. That's what it's learning right now. Okay? That's its new normal. Okay? Let's keep staring at it. We really want you to learn this well. Okay? You're getting very sleepy. All right? Now, look down at the dot between the two scenes. Right? Do they look the same anymore? No. Some people say the one on the right looks like a winter scene, the other like a desert scene, I mean a summer scene, something like that. Anyway, it's because your brain is now looking at these two scenes as if they were under those different illuminants. Okay? Again, you've redefined normality. Okay? So here are two identical dots, squares rather, okay? We're going to put one in a dark surround and one in a light surround. The one in the dark surround looks lighter than the one in the light surround, okay? This is a very well-known basic illusion called simultaneous brightness contrast. It's usually explained in terms of the fact that the one in the dark surrounds cause things to look lighter and light surrounds cause things to look darker, okay? That's not the explanation. The explanation is not that they're light and dark, it's what that light and dark information meant in the past. Okay? And I'll show you what I mean. Here we have the exact same illusion, two identical tiles, one in a dark surround, one in a light, one in a dark surround, and one in a light. Okay? The one in the dark looks slightly lighter than the one in the light. Everyone agree? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal the rest of the two scenes, okay? and you can see what happens to your perception. I'm not going to change anything within those boxes. Right? Now, these two look nearly identical. And this looks ver very bright, and that looks very dark. And yet, this is still in a dark surround, that's in a light, and this is still in a dark surround, and that's still in a light surround. So what's changed? What's changed is I've added information that's consistent with your experience of these two surfaces being under light and shadow. If this were actually under shadow and reflecting the same amount of light to your eye as the one in light, it would have to be more reflective, just from the laws of physics. So you see it as being lighter. If these were actually under the same illumination and reflecting the same amount of light to your eye, they would have to be equally reflective. So you see them as being the same. Of course, there is no light and shadow here. There are no objects. There's no desk. This is just an image. But you can't help but see it that way. Right? So if we go back to Chevrolet's original illusions, we can take on board this idea and we can create incredibly strong perceptions where 
two things that are physically the same look different. So notice the bright orange tile there and the dark brown one on the top. Yes? What I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the rest of the scene, but I'm not going to change those two tiles at all. And you'll see that those are actually physically the same. Right? That's your perceptual reality, and that's the physical reality. Okay? Now, this is my favorite. We made this a few years ago. We have four gray tiles on the left and seven gray tiles on the right. Okay? Everyone agree? I want you to keep your eye on that one. Just watch that one and tell me what happens to your perception. Now, I'm not going to change that tile. I'm going to change everything around it. That's gray. The four blue tiles on the left are physically the same as the seven yellow tiles on the right. They're all gray. Okay? That's the physical reality, and that's the perceptual reality. Everyone understand? Those are not blue and yellow. They're gray. Okay? I haven't changed the color of them at all. Those two surfaces are the same. The one on the top looks darker than the one on the bottom, but they're physically the same. If I hide the rest of the scene, you can see that they're physically the same. Those two tables are the same. Okay? It's true. Right? The red one is the green one rotated, which means the height of the green one is the same as the width of the red one, and the width of the green one is the same as the height of the red one. Okay? The only thing that's different is the angles. Oops. So the green bars are the same length, and the red bars are the same length. Yes? It doesn't look that way. What's true for perceptions of color, perceptions of form, is also true for motion. I like this one. So, so what we have, we have a wireframe diamond. Can everyone see that? Yeah, maybe if we have the lights up, would that be possible? So, I'm just going to rotate that diamond, okay? And everyone sees it rotating, of course, and everyone probably sees it spinning this way, okay? Now, keep looking at it, blink your eyes, look around it, and suddenly, it'll appear to flip and go the opposite direction. Some people have got it. Yes? If I say it's an IQ test, does that get faster? Raise your hand if you've got it. And every time you blink, it might flip. And when it flips, it also changes shape. Yes? You ever get it? Now, the question, of course, is which way is it actually rotating? How do you know? Right? It could be rotating either direction. That's the problem. Right? Your brain bounces back and forth between the two possibilities, depending on where it looks. Okay? What about this? So as you can see, I'm going higher and higher in sort of cognitive stuff. So we have just a blob of a bunch of white stuff. Can anyone see a word in that? <laughs> if I add some red, I haven't changed the white at all. Can now you see a word? Yes? Now, well done. Now if I take the red away, you can probably all still see it. Yes? Now this one's quite good, okay? So, this is an illusion in the sense that nothing's really moving, but let's just, I want you to see, the, the f I want you to see two possible ways of seeing what I'm going to show you next, right? Here you see an orange and a green bar moving up and down, and here you see an orange and a green bar moving as an X, left and right. Okay? Everyone see that? Now. What I want to show you is depending on how you look at something, without changing at all, just how you look at something will change the way you see it. Now, everyone probably sees an X going backward, back and forth. Yes? What I want you to do is I want you to look at the junction between the green bar and this purple background. And when you do that, you'll, at some point, the green and the orange bar will flip, and they'll start moving up and down. Yes? Do you get that? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the junction between the green and the orange bar. And now you have an X. And you look there, and now you have two bars. 
And depending on where you look, you'll see exactly opposite perceptions. In fact, in my lab, if we get you to stare there and attend to these different points, your perception will change. So the pattern of light that falls in your eye has not changed at all. It's just how you attend to it will change what's perception. Okay? So what does this all mean? Okay? The illusion of illusions. Titchener, this is a quote of Titchener's work, who is um, an artist who was up for a Turner Prize a few years ago, and he often uses illusions in his, in his installations. So here's a quote of his stuff. Titchener uses dizzying optical illusions to demonstrate, the, to emphasize the fragility of our senses, okay? Which I have to say is complete rubbish, all right? Human perception is not fragile. Illusions don't show us that human perception is fragile. If it were fragile, we wouldn't be here, okay? What illusions really tell us is that the brain did not evolve to see the world as it is. Seeing the world as it is is not actually important. In fact, seeing the world as it is is impossible. I can never get direct access to the reflectance of this surface because it's always going to be under an illuminant. Okay? I can never see it objectively. All right? So I can never see the world as it is, okay? which means what we actually see is simply what proved useful to see in the past. That's all we ever see. Okay? So why does, coming back to the question is, why does context matter? Because what it does, it relates the present to the past. Okay? The context itself has no meaning except in relation to the past. Okay? And how do I see? I see because my brain evolved to continually redefine normality. It has to. It has to constantly adapt to its interaction with the world. Are we the only critters out there that see illusions? Okay. Well, the answer to that question is no, because this problem of ambiguity transcends humans. It applies to any visual system. Bees, for instance, even see illusions. All right? So here is what we call the bee matrix in my lab. Right? We call it the bee matrix because we can completely control the visual history of a bumblebee. And here's the bumblebees that you would have seen outside. And she forages from these plexiglass stems as flowers, and when she lands on the right flower, she gets a sugar reward. Okay? And here's the bee arena in action. This was an installation in the Haywood and various other places, so we sort of take it on the road. There's your queen. These are all the daughters. These are the eggs. The bees go, the foragers go back and forth from the hive to the arena via this tube. Okay? And that's a guard bee. And you'll see one, because you see she's got a little number on her. There's another one that comes out. She sees she's got a little number. Okay, they're not born that way, <laughs> right? We s pick out the foragers, because not all the bees forage. We pick them out, we put them in the fridge, and they go to sleep. And then we can super glue a little number on her, right? And now she's getting a reward if she goes to the blue flowers, right? So she's sticking her tongue in there, called papabosis, which is like a long straw, and she's sucking up the sugar water. Now that's like drinking a glass of water that big to you and I, and then flying, right? Often, what they learn is to copy the other bees. So now here she comes, she com she's coming down the ladder, and she's going to find an empty egg, which is, in a, hun which is a honey pot, okay? And then she's going to throw up into it, okay, and that's honey, okay? Now, she's supposed to be going to the blue flowers, right? right? Now, what are the bees in the upper right doing? Right? They're supposed to be going to the blue flowers. Now, actually, she's got it right. She's going to blue flowers under green light. So they've parsed those flowers into different quadrants, and they're looking at the relationships between the colors in order to figure out which one to go to. They're phenomenally clever. They can count to five. They can recognize human faces. They're amazing, right? What's more, we can track the flight of the bumblebee, literally, within this space. Now, this is a bee that's entered the arena for the very first time. She doesn't know where to go. She knows she gets a reward if she goes to these flowers. She knows she's flying like this around the opening. 
That's because just like you, if you were to walk out of your house for the very first time, what you would do is turn around and see what your door looked like. That's what she's doing, so she knows how to get back home. Now she's going out and she's testing randomly flowers because she doesn't know which one's rewarding, okay? Same bee, two minutes later, flies out of the hive and lands on a flower, right? Amazing, I think. Now let's show how good we are at doing this. Now these are automated robots that are supposed to be able to move around an environment all by themselves. Okay? And these are the top minds around the world creating these autonomous systems. Right? Millions of pounds go into this, are spent on trying to get these vehicles to navigate the space. Okay? I love that one. Right? I think you get the point. The bee does it with this amazing little brain. This is a cross-section, so if the bee were looking at you, it would be a cross-section of her brain, like this. Okay, the eyes would be sticking out the side. Okay, how big is that brain? We all know what the size of a euro is. Can you find the brain on there? That's the bee's brain, right? It's got a million brain cells. 250 times fewer cells than we have in one retina is able to do the things that our most sophisticated computers can't do, right? We can also, however, take advantage of evolution, and we can evolve artificial life systems to solve these problems, and then do behavioral experiments on these artificial life or artificial robots. So here we have an, an artificial ecology made up of surfaces of different reflectance under different illumination. So you can see the colors are changing. It's because the illumination over the scene is changing. And then we can put these artificial life in. They have little brains. They have little neural networks. Now, she hasn't evolved yet. She's supposed to find the blue surfaces. So she runs around, and then she jumps in a hole. Right? This is one that's evolved. Right? So like a little bee, she's running around, and she's finding the blue surfaces, and then she's foraging from those blue surfaces. OK? Here's one that reproduces there. So everything about this is open-ended. Okay? It is evolution in the computer. Everything about them, they have to decide whether to mate sexually, asexually, whether to eat, how much to eat, whether to move right, left, up, or down. Okay? Now, what's amazing about these little systems is that they not only get it right like we do, they can recognize surfaces under different lights, they also get it wrong exactly like we do. So they would say that those two surfaces are different. The one on the dark surround is lighter than the one on the light surround. They would say that there are lines in the corners of that image. We see it, but those lines don't exist. It's called a Vassarelli illusion. Okay? Some of you might see a dark stripe and a light stripe. Those are called mock bands. We see them, so do these little artificial life systems. Right? All the illusions that we see these little systems see. Okay? So I'm going to come to a conclusion so far, which is this, that the brain is actually a liquid architecture, okay? That evolved to continually redefine normality. Okay? What we see, conceive, and believe are manifestations of our past interactions with the unknown sources of meaningless information. Okay? There are no absolutes, can't be only perceptions of a world relative to a changing normal. Okay? That's true at the simplest thing that the brain does, seeing color. So it has to be true all the way up. Okay? So who cares? Should this matter to anyone outside neuroscience? What well, I would argue that it does matter, because it says something also that transcends neuroscience, which is that no one is an outside observer of nature. Okay? No one is defined by their essential properties, by the stuff that makes us up. Okay? Each of us are defined by our ecology, by our interaction with our environment. Okay? And that interaction is necessarily relative, historical, and empirical, i.e., it's through trial and error. Okay? That's something that applies beyond neuroscience. In fact, it's the basis, I'd argue, for three principles, or three ideas. One is compassion, okay? and I'm just going to read it. 
to see one's thoughts, to see how one's thoughts, feelings, and beliefs are necessarily relative to one's own physical, social, and cultural ecology is a route to a more compassionate view of nature and human nature, right? Because if I understand that everything I see, even, even see, is grounded in my ecology, in my history, in my experience, it means that I can have a more empathetic view towards someone else whose views might differ from mine, right? Similarly, creativity, okay? By understanding this, I can become an active agent in the creative process rather than just a passive one, okay? It also underlies choice, okay? By understanding that much of our behaviors are cognitive reflexes, right? If I evolved to see the world in a way that was useful, it means that most of my behaviors are just simply reflexes, they're responses. Right? By understanding that, it means I have the possibility of responding differently, and therein lies a choice. Okay? And finally, community. And by community, I mean everything, our environment. Okay? By understanding that our reliance on our community goes well beyond just simply resource, but defining who we are, by understanding this process, we are, uh, how we're shaped, we can feel a stronger sense of belongingness, connectedness, and being a unique part of the whole. Okay? So, to see is to respond. To see yourself see is to give yourself the possibility of responding differently in the future. Okay? So how can we communicate and explore this idea in a more public setting? Well, one is through presentations like this. Another is by creating spaces that enable people to sort of see myself see, to put people in the process of seeing themselves see. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, one concept I like to introduce is this idea of street science as opposed to public art. Okay? Street science, what that is, are real experiments in public spaces. Okay? Not demonstrations like this, but real experiments. Okay? Why would we want to do that? The thought is by enabling people to see themselves in the world differently by making them part of the process of discovery. Okay? With the aim of fostering a more empathetic view of nature. Okay? Why shouldn't you do this? Because it's really risky. There's tremendous potential for public humiliation, right? Because most experiments don't work, right? If they did, we'd understand everything, right? So that's what we do. We do these public experiments. So we take the B arena, for instance. This, is a, this was, again, in the Hayward. This happens to be a gallery in Dublin. And for two weeks, do real experiments in the setting of an art gallery. Okay? And what's more, we've etched the flight of the bumblebee into these glass towers so we can capture time and space, and people can actually see how this bee's behavior changes with time, which is, in fact, showing them the same process that they go through when they're learning to see. Okay? We also, actually, this was just last couple weeks, we also took the bee arena, for the, so I've done that a lot, but this is the first time we actually took the bee arena to a school, and all the kids designed the experiment. Okay? I was simply their technician. They designed the experiment, and here's There's only two of these in the world. an autistic boy and explaining the bee arena to the rest of his class. Okay? He absolutely loved this experiment. There's, there's only two of these in the world. And what are these? The boxes? Um, two of the boxes in the world. Um, and those there are like flowers, and they're not doing experiments what the colours they're attracted to. And in those little things there is like sugar water. You have the same amount of sugar and the same amount of water. That's basically like the nectar pollen stuff. Well, is it nectar or is it pollen? It's nectar. Nectar, very good. And they use it to make their honey with and home. And in here, there's the bumblebees, and they still make honey. And That's there's right. bees underneath there. Yeah. Why, does she, why have they built a roof on it? Because they're cold. Because they're a bit chilly in here. And yeah. also, I'm going to be lucky, because they're gonna, you're going to give me a beehive. <laughs> which is true. I gave him one of the beehives. Right here. Uh, which his parents um, loved, I'm sure. Um, so, and this is the kids actually performing the experiment, okay? And so they're letting the bees out into the arena, okay? And they're recording where the bees fly, okay? So they're collecting the data, 
And now, uh, last week, I took four of them to the pub. <laughs> Literally, we had to get parent permission for that. But we took them to the pub, and we started writing the methods section. So we're actually going to submit this as a paper, 25 authors, all of whom are eight years old or younger. Right? They should all get master's degrees, right? Because they've made an original contribution to science. No one knew what the result was going to be. Okay? So I'm going to show you another example called synesthetic. Okay? And to give you the context for this, I want you to notice this little uh, um, shellfish here called a stomatopod. She's coming out of her hole there. And this is all in very slow motion. And she hits that crab with a force of a 22 caliber bullet. Okay? She can break your hand. You have to put them in really thick tanks. Okay? What's amazing about these things is not just their coloration, but their eyes. They've got these amazing eyes. The most complex visual system of anything around. Okay? And they've got these stripes, which this is the part they actually see the light with. Okay? These ro seven, eight rows of receptors. And the way they see is by moving their eyes up and down. And so they have so many color receptors. We have three that we see light with. They've got 14. Okay? So, so many that people think they might use light in the way that we use sound. So using that idea, we created a way of people hearing their visual world by translating the light that falls into their eye into sound. So here's Dave in the lab. He's holding a camera. You can see a line there. That line is made up of 32 blocks. It's going to be broken up, and it's uh, going to be translated into sound. And you'll hear the sound that he hears. Now, he's going to close his eyes. And he's got to find a plate on the floor with his eyes closed. And he does it, right? So we can use this not only to create a prosthetic for the visually impaired, but we can enable people to experience the world in a completely different way, but also put them in a position of learning to see, learning to make sense, literally. Okay? But we can also enable people to make music with color. So again, working with kids, though we're also working with uh, the London Sinfianata, Tate Modern, various other people. But more fun is to work with kids, and it was, they had to learn about patterns you see, patterns you hear. What might the patterns you see sound like if you could listen to them? Right? So then they went off, and they had to make visual patterns according to what they might sound like. Okay? So they're learning about abstraction and relationships, whatever, using those words. And here's what they've recreated. So he's composing for a 32-piece orchestra by placing color in space. Okay? That happens to be my son's. And he said, not to mention it, because I told him I've shown this literally to thousands of people. And he says, it's difficult being famous. I'd rather you didn't mention who I was. So here's one final example we call the beacon, which went up in Old Street last year. And this is another kind of a public experiment. So what is it? Well, in some sense, it's a light installation. It's a six-meter light installation. It's completely off-grid. It's driven by solar panels on the top of the panel, on the top of the tower, okay? But it's also driven by the pavement. So we invented these new paving stones made of recycled bottle glass from the Hackney pubs, okay? This is in Hackney. And we embedded solar panels in these, okay? And then we laid them out as a new pavement. So basically, it's a path of glass, okay? And there's the glass, and that's what completely drives uh, the lighting for the beacon. So when it doesn't light up, it's because there wasn't enough energy harvested that day. When it lights up, it was a good day. Okay? But it's also an experiment. So that's literally an experiment. We're getting data on that. And now we're talking to the Olympics about possibly paving much of the Olympic Park in these. Okay? So it's literally street science. Right? But it's also an experiment in community ownership, because the idea was that Half the money uh, 
from possible future sales of these stones will go back to the local community that took the risk to fund it through something called the Shoreditch Trust that does social development in, in Shoreditch and uh, Hoxton. Okay? So the community, in a very literal sense, owns these stones. Okay? And finally, our last project is that we're creating a new school, which is based on we're both the curriculum and the architecture, based on the concept of seeing yourself see, where the emphasis, again, is on compassion, creativity, choice, and community. Okay? So, some thoughts to remember. The brain continually redefines normality. We're defined by ecology. There are no illusions, or everything's an illusion. And only by understanding the source of one's own humanity can we accept and respect the humanity of others, okay? And I'll finally leave you with a demonstration. Oh, actually, what I was going to do, I was going to put it up here, wasn't I? All right. So. So this is a bit of a magic trick. Okay. Oh, let's see. If I have it down here, can everyone see? Uh, better up there? Okay. If you give me one second, do you mind? I'll just move that back. I need those. Okay, can everyone see the light coming through that one? All right. And everyone see the light coming through that one? Okay, so what do we have here? Right, we have 25 purple surfaces on your right, 25 green surfaces on your left. Okay, everyone agree? Brilliant. Now, yellow, pink and yellow. All right, pink and yellow, all right? Those are different from those. Brilliant. All right. Now, what we're going to do, and, and, right, I'll show you that after, right? Okay, so now, what we're going to do is we're going to put the center nine pinky purple surfaces under greenish yellow light, okay? By putting, simply putting this filter behind them, okay? So now, the light going through those center nine is passing through a green filter, green and yellow, and a purpley pink filter, okay? Those nine. So you can see the light that falls into your eye is now different. We're now going to put these yellowish green, middle nine ones, under a pinky purple light, and you can see those also change. But you, what you might also notice, if you ignore the intensity differences, is that these middle nine, the light coming from them, is exactly the same as these middle nine. Everyone agree, right? Why is that? Because the light here is going through a green, then pink filter, and the light here is going through a purple, then green <coughs> filter, okay? So the middle nine are the same, okay? Now let's reveal what's going on. Now remember, those middle nine are the same. Do they look the same? Now the question is, is that an illusion? <laughs> and I'll leave you with that, so thank you for coming. <laughs>